Um, again, thank you for taking time to, to join us today. Uh, <clears throat> what? Look at those handsome gentlemen. That's that's Patrick and Andrew. I'm from Production Solutions in Northern Virginia. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, and I'm Andrew Olson with uh, Altus Marketing. It's good to be here with all of you today. Excited about uh, jumping into this content with y'all. Right on. Um, Andrew's going to get the first couple of slides, then I'm going to shift in, but uh, let's rock and roll. Yeah, and just, just to preface, what we're going to show you here are um, about 20 different tips that you can take away right away to uh, impact your fundraising. Some of them are things that we've uh, we've done within one of our respective companies. Others are just things that we've scanned across the, uh, the uh, industry that we think will be helpful and insightful for you. So the first thing that we want to talk about is, um, you know, one way to increase responsiveness and engagement with donors is definitely to ask them about themselves. And it seems really simple, but very few organizations actually take the time to do it. Um, the, the benefit of this, you know, whether it's through a survey or a phone call or some sort of engagement, is that it allows you to better customize your communications to those supporters in the future. Uh, and it shows you who's really committed to your organization versus who might be uh, just, a, you know, an occasional transactional supporter. Donors Choose uh, did a, a study on this. They actually tested this in real time uh, and found that for people who they asked for information about themselves, uh, they saw a 37% retention rate for that audience and an average gift of just over $60. Uh, but those who didn't get that survey request to share information about themselves and why they supported the organization only had about a 14% retention rate uh, and just a $43 average gift. So clearly in the numbers there, you can see that even, uh, even just asking that question and, and offering the donor an opportunity to tell you more about themselves uh, is something that can definitely impact both revenue and retention. And yes, the slides will be available after the presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my, my, the topic I'm going to be talking about first really is some examples of how to maximize some digital print and mail shop technologies, specifically streamlining and finding cost savings and really a lot of time savings to maximizing your house data to create a closer connection to the donor. And I have, about, I have a handful of examples for you. The first one here is from American Cancer Society. Uh, what we did was help them completely transform their knowledge program to a fully digital program. Before, this was very time consuming, expensive, especially when you're dealing with inventory management. Um, you know, and this group itself has dozens and dozens of, of different chapters and signers, which can be very burdensome. Uh, what you see here are just four forms that start from a completely plain white sheet of paper, eight and a half by 14, where every single thing on here is variable. These are just four examples, but the versioning is really <clears throat> endless. And last time I checked, we have over 100 107 and growing versions that mails three times a week in home really fast. Um, it's a good amount of front end programming that you have to do, but once it's set up, it really is um, very powerful from a speed and impact uh, standpoint. Next up is a Special Olympics. What we did was uh, we had a, a challenge of really here trying to save some costs on a program. And so we huddled with the client and the agency to take a deeper dive into the program and the package itself. <clears throat> what we learned was the best way to save money on this is to cut time out of the process and simplifying the program. Uh, with a simple tweak of a, of a window on the note card package, we converted over nine packages into one package, this note card package, uh, letter note card, and it's all digital. Ironically, the simplification of this program has given the client a lot more flexibility and customization of this package of all the images, copy, and again, another chapter organization just, just has a ton of, of a complexity of the program. Next one is um, Heifer International. You may be familiar with them. They, they're best known for their holiday catalog that goes out where you can purchase an animal as a symbolic gift for your friends, family, or, or churches. And one of the, the, the big challenges they have is <clears throat> these gift givers in the holiday season it's hard to convert them into mission-driven donors. And there's so many great things that Heifer does to try to pull them away from just giving a gift. 
And here you'll find an example where we created a new donor track for these catalog responders. It speaks directly to the animal that they donated. Uh, so we have three examples here of a goat, chicken, and bees, but they have dozens of different animals that they can speak to. To that person you see up top, it's personalized to their name, speaking about the goat that they received, what it impact it actually has on that village in the world that, that they're donating to. Um, and it's extremely personalized. And um, this is a self mailer that goes out, I believe, every week. And it's a, um, it's been, it's it definitely helped. The final example of sort of maximizing digital is one we just, we just uh, worked on. It's the, the, the governor of North Carolina and his team have done everything they can to try to get people populated, sorry, vaccinated in their population. Uh, over the past couple of months, they've learned that certain zips and demographics have just res have resisted in getting their, their first shot. So we worked with a couple with, with Simio Cloud to really target not only the zips, but also by gender, ethnicity, income level, and personalize this postcard. We've done a couple of them already to really export different photos of that match those demographics, whether it's the gender or the ethnicity, to best connect with, 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 a, with that crowd. Um, we're able to also personalize to every single level of the different vaccination center, uh, their location of that and address, mm -hmm. and uh, phone numbers. And uh, uh, it's a very, very dynamic program that we're really proud of and is, is continuing to, to go out. <clears throat> Now, the next thing that, that we want to talk about is QR codes, right? So three years ago, I think all of us on this call would have said QR codes are ridiculous. They're a waste of time. Nobody uses them. Uh, one of the silver linings, if there are any from the COVID uh, pandemic, is that they've really driven a higher level of adoption of QR codes. That and, and the, the change with uh, phone technology to embed QR code readers directly into your phone cameras have made it a lot easier for people to uh, interact with QR codes and to find value in them. So we were, we've been testing this with a number of organizations. One, uh, one of our partners, Ducks Unlimited, we tested this on their acquisition uh, campaign uh, several months ago. We found that 33% of the people who uh, scanned the QR code that was on the outer envelope went on to, to become a member. So uh, it was a really good learning for us, a, a, a great insight into how we might be able to use this technology uh, across the board for other clients and, and certainly um, made us start thinking about ways to embed and engage um, donors with QR codes throughout packages, whether it's a, a direct drive to donation, a volunteer sign up, uh, a, a QR code like this could launch a, an interactive you know, experience for the donor or a video testimonial, any number of ways uh, that you can use these to both increase conversion and also just increase engagement with supporters. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, just to rewind real quickly on this digital digital piece before I go into my Q, QR code example, and it, these digital things are really great for lower lower quantity programs, no inventory management, and it saves you a ton of time in the in the copy approval process, which we know usually is really the challenge of, or, of getting together with your clients to uh, have a really up to date copy. Uh, the next up on the QR example really is uh, <clears throat> Boston's Children's Hospital. You know, every year they do a Valentine's Day campaign that's purely digital since 2018. Uh, a hard copy wasn't, of this card was not sent before, but the, the main objective is really a cultivation of their best donors, the high dollar donors, um, and, and to show support for the patients in a different way. A switch of strategy was done mainly because of COVID and the worry about protecting your staff and patients and not logistically having the staff in-house to handle and process all these returning and in incoming cards. <clears throat> now, it's just a card to a donor with a QR code uh, for them to enter their messages. The, the QR code area was a direct result of the pandemic, uh, and they felt more confident doing this because it's so much more common now. Where they go shopping or restaurants, people, and older donors really are, are comfortable um, scanning this and understanding it. Uh, the bonuses of doing this, they saved 
on printing costs for a return card, they save on postage for a return card. There's really zero cost from a limited cost for the QR code itself. And it's an additional engagement with their donors to make sure you ask for support and engage with them um, and post our messages. What's more, uh, three times as many people use the QR code as they typed in the URL. Uh, overall, the number of mail recipients who posted messages online was low. Uh, they could only match back about 2%, and I'm sure there are even more if they uh, required an email. The digital campaign resulted in 46,000 messages to patients, up 28% from the year before, and the revenue was up 26% over the prior year. So just a, a really good example of maximizing uh, technology. I noticed there was a question in the chat about the average gift on that Ducks Unlimited example. Uh, the average gift remained consistent uh, primarily because of the offer. Uh, there, there's really a single price point for their membership. So uh, we didn't see much variation in, in the average gift uh, versus QR code versus any other channel. The, the next thing I want to talk about is this is an example from our friends over at Next After. Uh, they've done a ton of testing around uh, email engagement and conversion rates. And one of the things that they've found in their testing, and we've since replicated in, in testing uh, of our, on our own as well, is the use of um, photoless and, and really design-free uh, email campaigns versus more highly designed templated campaigns. You can see on the left side of the screen, you've, you've got the standard control. It has the masthead, it's got photos, and it's got you know uh, footer images and things like that. And then on the right side, what looks like an email that any of us would have just typed on our computer and sent out. And um, the, the really exciting thing that they found here is that you know the, the control uh, version of this with the photos brought in a conversion rate of about a 0.44 compared to a 0.75 on, on the uh, photo list and, and design free uh, email, uh, email version. So it's a, almost a 70% increase in conversion rate which is pretty stellar. Uh, we've seen time and again, this, this kind of approach work really well. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I've seen recently is the higher value the donor uh, that you're engaging with, the, the more likely uh, that they would convert on a, um, on a very simple text only email. So we tend to use a version like that for mid-level campaigns and even major donor engagement campaigns as well. I think there might be another, uh, yeah, here's, Here's another example, um, you know, not as stark of an increase in performance, but still almost a 28% you know, uh, increase in conversion rate for the text only versus the more highly designed version. Um, and both of these were newsletters, uh, but we've seen it also with solicitation emails as well, similar performance. So here's a, a really interesting one, somewhat counterintuitive to me, but um, the, the idea that messaging uh, for a donor and telling them that you know even a penny or even a small amount will help and will go a long way uh, as you're making a, a fundraising ask, whether it's in print or digital or, or even you know thinking that it would be a great face-to-face uh, -face fundraising opportunity, uh, ha has some pretty significant merits to it. So Patrick, if you go to the next slide for me, please. Um, PETA tested this and we, we were fascinated by the results. So uh, they, they tested using the line, even $3 can make a difference. Uh, so, you know, very, very simple, one, one line of text change uh, in this campaign. And what they saw was that adding that statement uh, improved their conversion rate by 69% without any negative impact to average gift or revenue per visitor. So um, it's just a, a great confirmation for this idea that letting a donor know that even a small investment that they can make, that they don't have to, you know, make a major gift, they don't have to make a, a, a you know, very significant major uh, contribution, but even a small gift can go such a long way, has the potential to really impact your performance. And we have a couple of questions in the Q&A um, on the email plain versus uh, HTML rich with pictures. Uh, is your hypothesis that the conversion has to do with increased load time for the HTML? Or is it uh, spam filters looking uh, askance at HTML email? Or what do you think the mechanism is there? Uh, I think there's, there's definitely merit to that. Uh, we know that uh, load time has a really significant impact on conversion, and we, we see it on the commercial side. I think I just looked at a stat today from 
uh, from David Schwab over at CDR Fundraising Group and More Digital. And I think that they said that for every um, for every second of load time reduced from uh, from Walmart's website, they saw a two percent increase in their conversion. So I definitely think that load time is, has an impact there. I also think though that um, you know just be particularly with higher level, um, mid level, major legacy gift audiences um, that they tend to favor for the most part simple engagement rather than anything that's flashy. So I think part of it is just also donor preference and behavior. And then the second question is on the legitimization of small gifts. Um, have you seen clients using the penny concept in their face-to-face -face fundraising efforts? You know, I, um, I unfortunately am not that close to face-to-face -face campaigns. Um, so I, I don't know, um, I don't know that, that I've seen it anywhere, but uh, the logic of it makes sense to me. I don't know, Nick, maybe you have. Uh, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, some of the early research on the legitimization of small gifts and even a penny will help was from uh, some of the Cialdini uh, research uh, was in face-to-face -face fundraising. So it's actually a technique that came from face-to-face -face and now is working in the uh, digital and mail realm. So uh, we do see that work in face-to-face -face fundraising. Another one that's uh, common in face-to-face -face is uh, the pick technique where you throw out an amount that is not round. That's part of why a lot of our asks in face-to-face -face are things like $19, because if you're asking for $20, that doesn't sound like, it doesn't stop a person short, for example. So, thank you. So the next, uh, the next opportunity for, for improvement is really about um, further customization. You know, Patrick talked about this, when he was talking about the, um, the, the digital uh, campaign, the digital production and digital print campaigns that, that he was showing earlier, this is another level of personalization that we saw the American Red Cross test. Um, and we've, we've also tested it with a number of other organizations. But what they were, their hypothesis was that if they could personalize even referencing geography to the, you know, the, the smallest geographic region, uh, most adjacent to a donor's home or, or location wherever they were being solicited, that would deliver a higher response rate than if they were, um, you know, if they were further out. So they, they tested city level personalization. So referencing the donor's um, home uh, uh, city in copy versus referencing their home state. And they, they sure enough saw that, you know, the, the city personalization, that very finite uh, amount of, of personalization there on geography delivered a 5.5% response rate versus a 4.1 on the state. And we, we've seen this time and again, where the more, um, the more specific you can get to the donor and the more custom you can get to, um, to making them feel like you understand exactly who they are and where they are. And by extension, that you quote, know them uh, in, a, in a deeper way than just any other organization that might send a generic solicitation that doesn't reference those kind of points. Um, that tends to increase response rate. And we've also seen that it has a positive impact on retention um, because it, may, you know, it, it conjures up in the donor's mind that you really are um, uh, connected to them and that they in turn are connected to you in a deeper way than just a transactional gift. A question from the Q&A on the QR codes. Have you used them on the OE or uh, strictly inside? We have used them both on the outer envelope and on the inside of the package. Any uh, reports on success rates, which you'd recommend or try them both or? I, I would recommend testing both ways. Um, you know, the, one of those things that we always say is like, you know, I, some of these things are, are known and are always going to work until they don't. Um, and some things work great on some files and don't on others. So I would say uh, test it both ways and see what works best for your audience. We, we've seen success in both. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we're gonna chat about donor advice funds. Uh, it's all the buzz right now. We're gonna show you some examples of how to, to incorporate them in mail. But if you're not familiar with donor advised funds, these are accounts that people set up specifically for donating to their preferred charities. They're just another option to, to checks, credit card, PayPal, Venmo that is always, you know, getting a bigger piece of the bucket. These are highly organized and motivated donors that mainly uh, donate because of their tax savings they achieve through these donations and accounts. 
you basically have a pot of money ready to be distributed. Uh, they're all the buzz and growing, especially given some of the re recent uh, stock market success over the years. And there's a whole lot of money in these accounts. So I can give you some examples here. Um, uh, the charitable assets and, and these were a total of 141 billion, 16.2 uh, increase uh, from 122 billion in 2018. I've listed some of the largest and um, most popular ones here for Fidelity, Schwab, National Philanthropic Trust and Vanguard Charitable. So what should you do? Um, here are some examples. Uh, well, first, though, we, well, some of our friends over at Emergent have some, an example here of incorporating the, what they've done in testing um, and really focusing on certain demographics that they have a, a client that's revenues doubled over one year and increased number of gifts by 60% over one year. and increased average gift by 25% year over year. Um, that's just a, one great example. Um, here, what, now, what should you do? The most common uh, <clears throat> is uh, the back of this top of the reply appears to the Humane Society. We've learned that uh, the, the key is to pieces of information that these donors look for is the full legal name of your organization and the federal tax ID. Those are the two key pieces that you need to make sure you integrate. The bottom here is bottom left with the circle on there uh, is a national is a survey from the National Parks Foundation. The key here, here is to keep reminding them over and over of different engagements that that is an option. And on the right is actually a DM solicitation from National Parks Foundation that removes any language about donating through the mail, uh, getting a check. Uh, there's no reply envelope, so you're, you're saving money on reply bringing that reply envelope and, and the postage for them send, sending it back. Uh, for three um, <clears throat> really important uh, things to, to make sure you do and when dealing with uh, DAFs is if you only ask once, make sure you ask at the end of the year. That's when the majority of these donations are being made for tax purposes. Also ask at the end of your fiscal year. Ask when you have a very large goal, you know, example being a capital campaign, budget shortfalls, matching gifts. And just remember, these people are investors, so they have investment-minded uh, philosophy. So if you have that type of, of, of copy and, and mission or challenge, they will really respond to that. Yeah, be, before I get into this next one, I just, just to go back to the DAF piece for a second, if uh, I would encourage any organization that's on this call uh, to, to spend some time getting to know George Whalen and Jack Doyle over at Emergent and uh, talking to them about their DAF solution that they've got because it is a phenomenal product. Uh, it does, you know, there are some, some requirements as far as transaction volume, the number of DAF gifts that an organization needs to get. I, I think it's uh, close to 2,000 a year. Um, but the, the impact they can make for an organization um, with their DAF solution, if you fall into that range, is, is pretty significant. So just a, a quick plug for them and encourage all of you to, to reach out if you, if you don't know them already. So this, this next test that we saw, um, this is a really interesting thing because you know, Nick said a few minutes ago that using, um, uh, using odd numbers tends to, to produce a lift in, in performance, particularly in things like face-to-face. -face. We see it in, in other direct response channels as well. But one of the other things that, that we've seen uh, in another test is the idea of using um, a banknote uh, denomination versus a, a, um, a, a different number. So here they tested 100 versus 95 and saw both an increase in average gift and an increase in response rate. So again, this is one of those things that I would say is not uh, an ever and always, but is certainly a test and find out. Um, and it's, it's well worth um, you know, testing this particularly online where it's not maybe not during the fall when, when you're doing most of your fundraising, uh, uh, but you know, throughout the year testing something like this to see whether or not you can create those incremental lifts across your channels would be really valuable. Next up, we're going to talk about informed delivery, USPS program that is really growing and um, make sure you're aware of, aware of it. Over 39 million people are, are utilizing this program. 
um, nonprofits are seeing about 11 to 15 percent match against their house file, which is two to three times larger than the average. <clears throat> Excuse me. From a PS production solution standpoint, we've done over 130 campaigns with 25 different clients in the last year, um, and it, that equates about $83,000 in savings. Uh, to, Moreover, the good news on this is that, you know, there's a 2% discount in, in their promotion window. And in 2022, the USPS was so nice to actually double this for us. Of all the things that they're doing these days, that's, we'll take it. Not only did they double to 4%, which is pretty significant, uh, they added additional month of discounts are available. Uh, so you'll see just a really picture right there. If you're not familiar, if it, you know, if it sends your email to your phone, you know, a picture of the mail, you can substitute it with an image that you want in a landing page to, to engage with your, with your donors. Uh, other programs that are going on, which you're aware of, and, you know, send me an email or a chat. I could send you a really cool photo, a, a calendar of what's coming up from this postal discounts, you know, the tactile, tactile and sensory interactive mail piece. You know, this is for, First and nonprofit mails and letter flats. Uh, really think of like embossed envelopes, the bubbly texture, uh, inks that are embossed on the envelope, sensory, scented, interactive. Those are the <clears throat> types of pieces that will qualify. Uh, you have a, the other option is emerging in, in tech, technology advanced. Uh, this is, think of near field communications, which is like the chip you have in your phone if you put it next to it. To how you use, use an Apple Pay type thing um, and voice assistant, whether that's Alexa commands. And that's, that's another example of trying to get some of these postal discounts. The last one, if you aren't doing any of these, this is the easiest one to do and recommend all of our clients do it. It's the earned value reply. If you have return envelopes with a BRE, or I'm sorry, with a, with a barcode, Sign up. All you got to do is sign up. You get a credit of two cents for every piece of mail that's that's mailed returned during that promotion. Promotions. Nothing you have to do except sign up. The USPS has made the the, the requirements amendments of this have been laxed. Usually there was a lot of requirements from quantity and timing, but that's been sort of eased back. But those are just some upcoming promotions that uh, to keep an eye on and make sure that you're asking your partners. Um, that you're doing at least one of these during those windows. Uh, sorry, a couple more for you. Personalized uh, color transform mail. You know, you won't see this more often. It's really for first class mail, and it's going after bills and statements, credit cards, uh, to incorporate more color into their pieces for some reason. So maybe this can work for some sustainers or some renewal programs that go out first class. Uh, might be an option for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the informed delivery windows uh, increased to 4% uh, and adding another month in there. And the mobile shopping, mobile tech, this actual window was closed, was reduced a month. Um, has, the rules are really, you have to have a QR code very prominent on the OE. First class does not qualify anymore, so nonprofits could do this. Um, you have to have a landing page for some type of interaction from a donation standpoint. Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about this in the email example, but uh, one of the other things that, that we think about, particularly this time of year, is you know, how, do we, how do we increase the, um, the load speed, particularly for donation pages, but website overall? I mean, the, any opportunity to decrease that load time uh, will, will produce a commensurate conversion rate increase um, and, you know, as, as this example said, you know, one organization was as high as a 7% decrease in sales for every second of increase in their website load time. So um, the more that, that people have to sit around and wait, uh, the more likely it is that they will jump off and just not return. In fact, I saw one study from eMarketer that, that um, suggested that when a constituent, this was a consumer uh, uh, website, but when a constituent abandons your site because of a load time issue, they don't just abandon it and come back an hour later or come back two days later to try it again. They simply abandon it and go on and, and, and create that transaction elsewhere. So I think there's probably a high correlation in the, in the nonprofit space as well. Um, and something to definitely watch out for. 
here just a, you know, some of you on this call may, may know even better than we, but here are some quick examples of, of things you can do to increase uh, that load time or to increase the, to decrease that load speed, load time uh, and increase your conversion. Uh, if I could speak today, sorry. Um, anyway, it's things like optimizing content, you know, minimizing your redirects and just, you know, all, any number of these and, and really looking at all of these uh, in conjunction because every little bit that you can chip away on that, uh, on that load time will improve your conversion rate uh, commensurately. So this is a, a, another interesting concept. Uh, we call it you know, testing a seed campaign. And really it's, it's about asking donors to support the overhead uh, of an organization so that more of your, more of, of all charitable gifts to the organization can go to program. And um, the, the model that you'll all be most familiar with would probably be like the charity water model. I believe Smile Train for a time used something like this. I don't know if they still do or not. But the, the, the concept being our overhead is covered by, you know, generous group of donors over here. So therefore, your dollars go directly to program. Uh, and there's, there's actually quite a lot of research um, uh, from Dr. Russell James over at Texas Tech about the, the value of this. And, and the, the psychology behind it is that donors uh, tend not to care about overhead costs as long as their gift is not the gift that's going to cover that overhead for the most part. So if, you, if you're able to find donors who will support this kind of thing and who understand the value of operating costs and, and that overhead is necessary to achieve mission, uh, getting them to seed that money to the organization so that you can start to talk in those terms to, to mass market audiences, um, could, could have a very real and significant impact in your ability to increase giving simply by letting donors know that, that their gift um, is offset uh, by, by a gift uh, to fund overhead so that they're going, you know, their gifts are going directly to mission impact. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, what we have here is a high dollar package from Save the Children. Uh, that they would send an enhanced uh, DRTD type DVD to their higher end donors. And I, I'm, I'm sure if I asked you how many of you are still using DVDs, I, that many hands would go up. Um, and you may notice that laptops are selling without DVD players and certainly not any iPads or, or surfaces. So I was, this was news to me. I never heard of this web key before. So that's what I introduced to you today. Uh, if you see at the top, the, um, you have the DVD on the left, but on the right was a white piece of paper and they had a little USB web key at the top that was um, tabbed on to that piece. So it's basically a USB device that plugs into uh, your computer that triggers a website to open and instantly engage the donor to whatever you want them to see. Uh, this gives you so much more uh, dynamic flexibility on the content versus a, a DVD, which is dated the moment it's pressed or created. So how did it do? The, the, here's the irony of this whole package. The web key actually costs more than the DVD to create. But they save so much money on converting this package to a normal letter rate that it brought the cost down the, so low that the results won. And they're much better. And it, <clears throat> the cost blew it away, specifically on, on the postage piece. And actually got, <laughs> we got the uh, seed up for this year's and the web key is no longer there because we use the QR code. <laughs> so it's technology that's out there um, shows you how the software is just really taking over hardware these days. Um, and that DVDs and, and things like that are just outdated. Uh, next on, we're gonna talk about calendars and my goodness, the elephant in the room right now in the industry is cost. You know, they're getting, whoops, let me go back up here. People are getting crushed on cost. And there's one program that's getting crushed overall is, is our calendars. Um, between the paper and the postage alone, this format generally is, is just not an option for so many organizations because of that cost. Ironically, since we started our own calendar gang at Production Solutions, we're mailing more calendars than ever. Uh, because of leveraging our volume 
and getting larger overall discount right now we're doing over we're doing calendars for over 18 organizations the biggest advantage actually goes to those small organizations you know 18 to 1000 to 50,000 uh, groups that couldn't afford to do it but now they're jumping in on 2 million and 5 million runs you know the key to all this is is planning Generally, this means you have to get your plan ready to go in quarter one. You know, we've we, we printed all of ours now, and almost all of them are already printed and out the door. But next week, we actually have a calendar game meeting internally. So <clears throat> your heart and your, your really your strategy has to be ready to print in April and May. So January, February is the time to talk to your production partner, your printers, and ask them if they have any upcoming catalog gaining opportunities and what the production dates are, you know, the art due date, data due date, to really jump in and save some money because goodness knows it's, the costs are increasing. Uh, next up, is, lastly, this is what we have uh, is really, it's not Patrick, cutting edge. Patrick, yeah. There's two questions uh, coming in the chat about calendars. One, one asks, uh, how many clients mail with a bound in return envelope? And is that in addition to a, like a loose VRE or, or CRE? Um, do, you have, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, great question, Tracy. Um, <clears throat> the trend has been people putting in two envelopes, one bound, so that when they open it up during the middle of the year, it's worth the cost of printing and binding that VRE. In, in July, June. Um, also having one in, in turn in floating as well because it falls out and it really jumps out of it. So that's definitely something that majority of clients are doing from a trend standpoint. Awesome. And then the second question and was- She also asked to your uh, alternative day planner. Yeah, some clients have reduced their size. So we have two different sizes for PF that, that can go on one's would go into a letter versus a flat. We have those, those large cost increases, but majority of them are the large nine by twelves, um, eight by ten calendars. Uh, but yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, next, next, the last thing we're going to talk about is it's not cutting edge because commercial clients will be doing this forever, you know. But for nonprofits, it it's definitely cutting edge. Um, so what is neuro fundraising? I have a slide here. It's a scientific study of human, human biometric response to fundraising stimuli in order to understand and measure the increase in the effectiveness of each stimuli within a targeted donor base. What does that mean? Well, the normal ways for really testing and getting feedback are extremely lengthy, expensive, and very biased on each respondent. You know, un their unconscious reaction to things. Normally people say what you want them to what you want what they want you what you want them to hear or what they want what you want them to hear and try to show the best version of themselves not their unconscious instincts this science removes that entire pretense you know by measuring their heart rate they hook them up to machines and they measure their heart rate the oxytocin the facial recognition and responses their body response sweating eyes and, and so much more and this way you're not using the participants' words of what they're saying, but you're actually seeing how they're responding and feeling. Uh, the, the benefit to this really is that it eliminates the, the lengthy long-term work on testing. You know, you can do this on DRTV, on mail, online and email. Brand recognition and, and the strength of their brand has been one that's really working with some of our clients. and. If you ever have an opportunity to speak some of the, to some of your clients' boards, I would definitely share with this, this technology because focus groups are really, again, very biased. Uh, the biggest takeaway um, <clears throat> that I got from, from this technology is that uh, you learn tenfold what you were expecting to learn when you go into testing something. Usually people test something, they want to really find out how did this image work or how did this copy work, but what they learn is completely unrelated and it's so much more informed 
It informs them so much more of what their strategy is or isn't doing, you know, in the, in the short term and, and long term. So it's, it's actually given our clients the ability to be so much more bolder in, in testing and rolling out tests and, and in their strategy. Uh, because again, that pretense of is, is completely removed of what they want, uh, how people respond by talking. So uh, that's a, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, we'll stick around here for a couple minutes. Um, you can contact us by email or phone at any time if you have any follow-ups. This this has been recorded. It will be up on YouTube and. We can send it to you digitally if you'd like to like to view it um, and share it with uh, your clients or your teams.